I hope all of you have made the submission for your literature review. I got one mail late last night which said that may require some more time, but otherwise I suppose everybody has submitted. Those submissions were obligatory and deadlines were hard. All of you are nodding your heads because you are among those few who actually come to the class in time, so you would obviously do things in time. So if you are going to zip, my suggestion would be that all LaTeX related artifacts you keep under one directory. All LaTeX related artifacts you keep under one directory and then the other two files which are separate files and then zip all of them. That should be fine. So can you issue an instruction? The more important part of this exercise was actually peer assessment which we have not yet touched upon. You are all submitting your literature survey. That's of course a critical aspect of this communication class that you should be able to improve your written communication to an extent that it stands on its own legs. So that much would be achieved partially by now and maybe uh, at the end of next week when you submit that. Should we say that one final chance for everyone to submit three files uh, the deadline is next Monday, right? Fourth. Yeah. All right. I'll extend that date in case you are improving something. I have unfortunately no credits or grades. Otherwise, those people who submit things in time could have been awarded a higher grade. Unfortunately, there is no grade for this course. You either pass or you fail. And uh, very limited flexibility. Uh, to use the standard stick and carrot approach. There is only one stick and no carrot. Not very useful mechanism. Anyway, so how many of you have participated in any kind of automated group communication? This is something that I wish to discuss today. As an example, we would take the case of automated peer review mechanisms. So how many of you have done any kind of forced peer review? Where is a part of any larger exercise, you are required to assess the quality of communication as submitted in the form of digital artifacts by several people and you get randomly assigned to assess some three, four, five submissions out of those. One, two, very few, three. Why others did not have an occasion? You, you did participate? So can you explain uh, what was the task at hand and how did you go about it as an individual? Sir, uh, I am from Army. There, uh, I was uh, as a faculty in the Military College of Telecommunication Engineering at Mount. So we have our journal called Technical Journal for Core of Signals. So there, our officers submit articles and uh, journal papers to be published in that. So I was given task to review the submissions done by the officers. So I used to assess. Uh, whatever was submitted in terms of uh, the originality of work, the importance uh, related to the today's uh, current uh, trends and uh, the originality of work in terms of own written or is it copied from somewhere. So those things were checked and uh, then recommendations were given for publishing or not. But that task you did as part of your instructor's duties anyway. Uh, anybody else who has participated in a peer review? Yeah. So there was a course on Coursera for coding in Python. So uh, we used to get uh, multiple submissions from other uh, course takers and we, uh, we need, needed to make a game. Uh, so there were few questions and we needed to play that game and uh, mark whether the uh, question was handled correctly. Okay. 
So, can you take an example and suggest how different people were awarded different marks by you? Sorry? How different people whose work you assessed were awarded marks? Were they different from each other or was it a zero-one kind of thing? Mostly, most of the suggestions <coughs> were correct. I see. Sometimes uh, something went wrong. So, How many did you assess in this fashion, the numbers? Per submission, per assignment, five to six. Sorry? Per, per assignment, five to six. Five to six. Yes. So there apart were... from making your own submission, you were required to assess five yes. or six other submissions. Yes. How much time did you have to spend on assessing those five or six versus the total time that you spent on making your own submission? Approximately. Making the submission about three hours and assessing about 30 minutes. 30 minutes for all six? Yes. So assessing was not very difficult? Yes. But did you, because these were programming assignments, did you execute that program which was submitted or you just went through it manually? Executed. We did, you executed, check, we did nice. not check the code. So here is an example of an assignment which is not very difficult to test. You can simply compile and execute a program. If it works, it works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Uh, but if you were to assess an essay type answer, like our friend, the instructor in Mahu had to do, where an assignment was submitted in the form of a paper. Not really an assignment, but a research paper. Now, you know how difficult it is to read a research paper. We have gone through that. So if you have to read every research paper carefully, and then to assess whether that paper stands scrutiny or not, and it would invariably not be a zero one assessment, right? You would give some A, B, C grades or some such thing. That would be harder, right? Yes. So approximately how much will it take for a person to assess, let us say, a four-page A4 size document, which is submitted by someone? About two hours. Two hours. And how much will it take for you to write a four-page assignment? Well, if you take everything from conceptualization, it may take six to eight hours anyway. Yes. Right? I mean, jotting down your ideas, organizing them, rewriting them, then checking correctness, etc. So roughly, the ratio is something like 1 is to 4. That means if you spend 4 units of time in preparing your own submission, then you would require 1 unit of time, typically, to assess somebody else's. So 3 to 5 assessments to be done by each individual, would amount to roughly the same amount of time that you would spend in your own assessment, in your own assignment. Is that, is that a good thumb rule? Can we generalize it? It will, of course, vary from, for example, programming as we just discussed. It's just a question of routinely compiling and executing it. And that you can do six or seven assignment checks in less than 30 minutes, in fact. Whereas a written essay, in the domain in which, of course, you have some understanding, because you have also submitted an assignment in a similar topic or same topic. So, roughly the ratio can be regarded as So, creation of one submission can be considered approximately equivalent of Do you agree that this could be a useful thumb rule? So, which means that if you are participating in a course, such as on Coursera or what we do in IIT Bombay X, for example, online courses, it would be reasonable if I forewarn the people at the beginning that your assignments will be of two types. One is you will have to submit your own assignment and the second is you will be required to randomly assess 
so many other ass assignments. Then that would be a fair game. All right. Now, let us consider some squiggles in this. So we agree that this could be the mechanism. The reason I want you to think beyond just these statements is because you are all CS students and you would be expected to actually design and build systems which will permit this to happen. So in Coursera, for example, what kind of system did you use? In Coursera, in peer assessment, what kind of automated system did you use? It is obvious that there is no human being who can intervene to look at either your submission or your assessment. So it must be an automated system. So did you, after the submission date, did you get a list of three or four or five submissions to be assessed by you? No. How did you come to know which submissions you have to assess? Automatically, yeah. What was the process of automation? Can you just explain that? Yeah, I used to get, uh, I mean, one by one, I used to get that you need to check this submission. I you would get know. one by one? Yes, I did not know which, which user's submission. I agree. So, firstly, it is an anonymous review, so I don't know whose submission it is. It would be obviously a machine readable thing, so I can't even figure out from handwriting or something like that. So it is anonymous truth. Secondly, he says he would get one assessment at a time. How much time did you get to complete that assessment? There was no time limit. There was no time limit. So suppose a, a lethargic person like me gets an assessment and does not submit for one week. I mean, there was that uh, one week deadline. But... Ah. So you see, you need to be very exact. So there is a one week deadline. Now suppose I take maximum of one week and submit my assessment at the end of one week. Only then I will get the second assessment? No, no. I mean, in that one week, you need to complete all the all five. So let us be more precise. In that automated system, when you would get up to four or five such assignments submitted by others to be assessed, what is the maximum time in which you were given all four or five, independent of how you completed or not completed? remember maybe three to four days three to four days but they would arrive one at a time sometimes two or three no, collectively five were given but oh collectively five were given yes. no you said you'll get one one at a time means you can check by one one at a time oh you are talking about one unit of assessment to be done for five submissions yes, I'm but you will get all five together yes in what form did you get the message? Did you get an email? It was on the website, Coursera. No, no. Website is all right. Website is a web page. So, web, website, by the way, is if it just comes on website, then I am not reminded whether something has come on my website or not, my, my dashboard or not. That means, do I have to constantly look for such thing? Or do I get a mail? Do I get a SMS? Do I get something? I don't remember now. Exactly. Don't remember. But you managed to do that. Yes. All right. So if at all we need to automate such assessments, what are the aspects that we need to keep in mind in order to build such automated system, which he has, let's say, partly described? So let us assume that uh, for an assignment or for something, some digital artifacts of a similar kind have been submitted by thousands of people and we wish to carry out a peer assessment of the kind which our friend described and we want to build a system for which we wish to write the overall functional specs. What should be the functionality of such a system? So as he says, after every assignment, he would get four or five assignments on his website. But he does not remember whether he got a communication independently as an email or SMS or he was required to visit the website and keep looking at such assign, assignments, that is assessment assignments given to you. So what would you prefer? Anyone? 
a reminder mail or something. But much before that, how do you choose whom to give a particular digital artifact for assessment? There are 10,000 people who have submitted. We have already agreed that every participant has agreed upfront to assess three to five other assigned, other, other submissions that we take for granted. Now, how do you choose which three or five assignments will go to him, which three or five will go to him, which three or five will go to him? Yeah. Random. Is that correct? Acceptable? Random choice of peers. Now, how do I make a choice if I have thousands of artifacts? What could be the mechanism? All that I have is 10,000 submissions. Again, uh, coded submissions, so the file names don't reveal anything. And given by 10,000 users, I have a table associating each user with the assignment submitted by that user. That information I have. Now, every submission I have to select up to whatever, three to five peers to assess that. So, how do I randomly select that? Everybody is familiar with random number generation. But a random number generation of this kind, where you are picking up one assignment and assigning it to three to five users, you have to flag those three to five users to whom we have already given an assignment. Okay. But each of them is supposed to get up to five assignments. That is how the system works. Is it very clear in your mind as to how that algorithm will work? Because towards the end, there will be absolutely no randomness left. There will be a few people left to whom few assignments have to be assigned. There's hardly any randomness there. So how do you go about it? Yeah. We could actually, uh, let's say if we want to assign three uh, papers to each person, we could have three different permutations of the whole set such that uh, the you do not get your own paper. Correct. So such three different permutations, I mean, will obviously land you with three different papers at random. So basically, instead of allocating a person like you allocate a seat in gate or JE score dependent fashion, he suggests that we could use a set of permutations, assuming that I have to assign everything to three people or four people or whatever, based on that parameter, I could create permutations of all the assignments and all the users and create. So let's say a possibility of using permutations. Good choice, I believe, but that is an algorithmic part. We are not discussing that as computer science professionals, you will be good in designing an appropriate algorithm. Just wanted to point out that it's not a trivial thing to do so. All right. Now, having done that, our friend submits his assessment for these four things. Everyone does that. But some people are lethargic like me, they don't submit in time. So how do we handle the assessments which are submitted now by people? So there is a deadline, as he said, within a week you are supposed to do that. First of all, how do you incentivize people like me to submit in time? Any suggestions? In the armed forces, there is no question of taking any liberties with deadlines, right? <laughs> you, you better do that. It's a survival instinct. Whereas uh, ordinary mortals like us, deadlines are indicative. <laughs> so how do we handle? Uh, let, let us put it this way, that we would like a decent, easy way for people to work, yet we would like them to work with the armed forces kind of discipline as far as deadlines is concerned. 
Now, how do you enforce it? Gamification. Can you explain? Basically, whatever the task that you have been assigned, we can we can uh, attach some in incentives, and then later on, based on those in incentives, uh, they will get benefited in the future. So basically, the word gamification is used primarily in the context of giving some kind of an incentive. So gamification is not in terms of playing games, but in terms of creating an incentive mechanism. Okay. As an incentive mechanism. Anything else? Because in real human life, carrot alone does not always work. A stick is also useful. Our friend uses sticks very effectively. There is no carrot, I think, in your case. Uh, uh, but uh, we, so what stick can we have? So at the uh, assignment that you have submitted, uh, its evaluation might get hampered. Ah, very obvious. I have submitted an assignment. I expect it to be assessed by others. <laughs> just as I am required to assess others, others uh, submission. Now, I do not complete the assessment of four submissions as is required, let's say. So, what the system can do is, dear Mr. Fatak, you have submitted your assignment. I am glad to inform you that that assignment was actually rated well by your peers. However, since you have not submitted the assessment of four other things which were sent to you, we are unhappy to announce that you get a fail grade in this assignment. Pass fail always works, or grades or marks will always work. So, this is an incentive. The other incentive is I think we should not really make it so strict as to fail somebody. Ah. We can only we can only hold back your results till the time you do not submit yes. it. So our friend here is a light-hearted person like me. I wish Professor Sarda was here to argue his case, but I will argue as if I am Sarda. He is suggesting that uh, Sarda is the name of my colleague incidentally. Many of you may know him. He teaches geographical information. Uh, and my guru in databases basically. Now, what he is saying is that we need not be so strict. All right. So, let me ask you a counter question. Suppose there is no peer assessment. I am required to submit an assignment in time. Two possibilities. I don't submit in time. And two, I don't submit at all. Or three, I do a very bad job. What will be the end result if it is submitted for an examination? Will I pass that exam? Depends on the kind of work that you have done. Oh, so that means I keep getting an assignment, I keep not submitting it throughout the year, and I can still pass? No. No. That's why I said it depends on the kind of work yeah. you have done. So you are very clear that if I do not submit an assignment, which is declared to be a required part of my total assessment, then I deserve to fail. Here is the point. I am pegging an assignment and assessment of four assignments at the same level. That is part of your task declared upfront. You don't like it, don't register for the course. No, but I still think that giving a, let's say, if I... I submitted my assignment. Huh. Now, after having submitted the assignment, the mere curiosity of uh, wanting to know my performance in that assignment would drive me to, you know, quickly submit the assessment so that I can. Correct. I think that is a better incentive, a positive incentive than to really have a stick and say you'll fail in this assignment if you do not uh, submit the assignment. That is because you are treating these two as independent components which have nothing to do with each other. No, I am saying, so wording is very important. 
how you word it up front in your entire offering of the activity. I think that is a good point he makes because ordinarily if I am a student, let's say, or a learner who is doing a course in Coursera or IIT Bombay X or wherever, like I have gone through a conventional exercise of education and therefore I will presume that the only reason for me to do this course is and to get a grade is to give my assignments in time. So as long as I do that, I presume that I deserve to pass. I need, the course people need to specifically state this upfront that your passing depends upon your completing the following tasks successfully. One, giving your quizzes and assignments in time. Two, doing the peer assessment in time. Then what about the quality of the peer assessment? That's a good point. So that was the third point I was about to mention. But in terms of incentivizing and disincentivizing, I suppose if a proper language is used, that should be adequate. Right. So, An important point is declare the criteria up front. You can't change the goalpost after the game begins. You declare it. Fine. Now, having done that, he raised the question. Yeah. This fail pass approach will work in courses. Correct. But uh, what about the conferences and journal peer review? Correct. Will it work there? I don't think uh, this fail grade, etc., is possible there. Okay. Is that correct? What about the non-course non activity? Very good points are being made, in fact. So, let me tell you how it is handled. It is handled through a different incentivization scheme for the reviews and other things that we talk about, where the recognition at the end of the long path is the only incentive. So you remember when last time we did an exercise in finding out what are the different entities that we will require, what are the different entity types, etc. And one of the entity types which was mentioned was reviewer. Now who is a good reviewer? This also embodies the question that our friend raised, what about the quality of assessment? So I might do, I might assess five peers, but I will do a shortage of it because I want to complete it quickly. Either I'll give all of them A grade or all of them D grades or whatever, whatever. I need, by the way, an algorithm method to catch such a shoddy job, which I cannot do on individual basis, but collectively, when I do a statistical analysis, I should be able to do that. And that is an important part of any automated system, analysis of the reviews that are submitted. But the point that you were making, is actually handled like this in, in such systems. In fact, that is why I think I referred to Professor Mausam's work on crowdsourcing. You should read some of his papers. He has built a system in IIT Delhi, which Ganesh and I are trying to get implemented here. So one of the aspects is that you cannot depend on the crowd. That is the common wisdom. What if the crowd does not participate or does not do a quality job? The fact of life is that you can build enough incentives, something like gamification. Something like gamification, but here again you state upfront that <coughs> such reviewers which come up to be consistently doing quality job and in time shall be recognized. Now, shall be recognized every vague statement. So, to attach something concrete to that vagueness. So I'll give you one example of what I have thought of doing for the large scale teacher's training program that we are going to run using this model, uh, the uh, faculty development program that we have designed. 
this April, May, June, they will roll out. I think I mentioned there is one faculty development program on use of ICT in education, effective use of ICT. And the second, second faculty development program is on uh, online and blended or hybrid education, where people, learners learn both from online. Now, as a part of the assignment, roughly 10,000 teachers are expected to participate in each of these. And the assignment that they have to submit are in the form of OERs, Open Educational Resources. So let's say I am a teacher of thermodynamics in some college, somebody else is a teacher of uh, 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 electrical engineering, etc., etc. I will form groups uh, through a mechanism that we will create, which is a manual mechanism because teachers will be assembling at remote centers which are identified. So there will be physical groups of 40 to 50 teachers assembling at a remote center across 300 places in the country. That is something which is not possible on a complete online mechanism. But we'll have these 40 people assembling at a place and they will be forming teams and there'll be team submissions which will be made. Now, the incentivization that we are talking about is, first of course, contrary to what our friend uh, believes, we will be declaring these criteria upfront. So no teacher will get a certificate of passing that FDP unless every teacher A submits the required assignments and assesses other assignments. That will be part and parcel. We will probably use Moodle which has a mechanism of randomly assigning things or we will take that Moodle algorithm and integrate it with IIT Bombay X that for a random assignment is good. Now comes the question of quality. So, how do you adjust the quality of assessment? Every assignment is assessed by five people and every person assesses five assignments. It is not a round robin. So, I assess some five assignments submitted by five individuals and each of these individuals assess assignments which are, as he correctly pointed out, I can do a randomized permutation matrix at the beginning. Now I have these assessments, okay. It is easily possible to do a sort and see which are the assessments which assess. Uh, something at level A, B, C, D, whatever, whatever, whatever. And, and who rated what? Okay. So now, suppose the majority of the people rate something as A. And let's say there are 200 assignments which are rated A. Now those who rated all of these as A, those who rated all Ds as Ds, are obviously better reviewers because they seem to be consistent with the majority opinion. The majority opinion itself may be wrong. Now imagine if I do that across four or five different submissions throughout the length of the FDP. And I have a unique opportunity after doing this, these people in groups are going to participate in a physical interactive session at a place. So suppose I say now, these 40 people who are there, from amongst these 40, you find out who did what and try to identify 10%, that is four or five people, whom in your opinion are great assessors. We can make the information available to all of them so I have an advantage of a automated process followed by a manual intervention, the manual filtering by peers. It is extremely difficult to use this manual intervention to grade all 50 people from 1 to 50 who assemble at one place. But it is entirely possible to correctly predict the five best people among the group of 50. You agree? So I'm not doing a ranking of all 50. I want the system to set five. 
Now, in some cases, there may be even 10, some cases, there may be only 3, because this will be combining the automated result with the manual interview. Now, suppose I say that these 5 people who are selected at each remote center will be given a recognition, special recognition certificate and a 1,000 rupee award, which means they can do a next FDP without paying any fees. Would it act as a reasonable incentive? These are some of the mechanisms that we need to think of. Uh, in, in, in the case that I just described, we are trying to combine the automated process with some human filtering at the end after the automated process has thrown some result. But the fact remains that in large group communication, unless you automate to the head, you will not be able to run things successfully. Take our Coursera course, for example. Would that course have the same meaning for you if you had only auto grader for the programming assignments rather than a human assessment? So you did value intrinsically the human assessment which was coming your way. And perhaps that was one of the reasons why you contributed by making your own assessment. But purely voluntary things uh, do not always work consistently over long periods of time. That is the reason we have jobs with salaries, no? Otherwise, everybody should be working purely for job satisfaction. But we work partly for job satisfaction, partly for salary. Large partly for salary. <laughs> so you need to have a combination and that is exactly what we propose to do that here. Uh, I do not know how many of you are working on associated uh, systems. For example, ranking algorithms. The whole, uh, uh, the entire area of machine learning is replete with whole lot of mechanisms that are available which ones to use for what purpose and how is not very clear in, in this particular case. We'll be attempting to do that uh, over this uh, summer. We have some exciting uh, summer interns. I mean, people like what you were three years ago before coming to IIT. You would have done your undergraduate study somewhere. So these are all third year students from over uh, what should I say, about 200, uh, and, uh, 130 summer interns we have chosen. They are also, we, have, we had 3,000 applications. So how do you assess 3,000 applications? Have you ever thought of actually looking at each application individually? So Professor Avinash Aute came up with a very simple standard thumb rule. <coughs> Any student who is a topper at the end of uh, fifth semester in a college is selected. Why? The simple thumb rule is it does not matter which college students are studying. The topper is a topper is a topper. Then he said some of the institutions of repute such as NITs and so on, he would go up to the second topper. Three years ago when he outlined this scheme, I asked him, but what about such large number of individuals who do not necessarily shine in academic performance, but are extremely creative and want to do something. So he has a 60-40 ratio. 60% of interns he selects like this. It's about 70 to 80 interns are selected like that. Then for all the rest, 2,500 people, he announces a software contest. And in that contest, people have to participate. And winners of that contest are selected independent of their academic standing. So that caters to a group of students who may not perform very well academically, but are extremely creative and good. And of course, then we have this standard funny cases of plagiarism. How do you detect plagiarism in such submissions, programming assignments? Automated checkers. Well, uh, automated checkers also will require you to submit. I mean, uh, like you check uh, plagiarism in research papers, you can check code. 
But you see, the students who copy from each other are really smart. So they will introduce different variable names. I mean, in, in handwritten exams, I remember, that is how we used to catch copy. That uh, they have actually changed the variable names in most of the program, but at one place, the original variable name appears by mistake. And then the fellow gets caught. Suffice it to say that in our case, what they did was very simple. They took all submissions from the same college. It's unlikely that uh, I am in a Mumbai college and I copy a code submitted by a student in Jarsuguda. It's quite likely that my own colleagues in my college is what I'll copy from. So that is how they checked and they found some copying cases. Then they wrote a letter and, uh, and promptly, in some cases, there were three identical uh, submissions, in some cases two. Promptly, we got messages saying, sorry, I copied. She did not or he did not. So admit him or her, not me. And uh, that is how it was resolved. Anyway, now these people, why I'm saying this is, these people will come here. Any one of you who gets an idea of using any known technique or algorithm that you are familiar with or you become familiar with, which will help in building a system of this kind, I would appreciate you sending a small email to me. We propose to assign groups of these summer interns to actually build a prototype of this system for group communication in IIT Bombay using Mofsum's work. Achha, for the interviews which I'll be conducting, the mock interviews, there are two major exercises which are still remaining, by the way. One is uh, uh, weaving TED Talks and writing their summaries. All of you are familiar with TED Talks? So how many TED Talks have you seen, have you viewed? They are not very long talks, they are generally 18 minutes as a thumb rule. This is a good type, a compromise between 5 to 7 minute course video versus a 1 hour lecture like 5 months lecture. So how many such videos have you seen? Any numbers? Anybody who has seen more than 5 TED Talks, can you raise your hands? Raj, okay. More than 10? Okay. More than 20? Fewer. More than 50? One. Uh, if I continue like that, it might turn out that you mostly do TED talk weaving and occasionally do other things. <laughs> I'm just joking. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, these TED talks, because they are talks by individuals, they combine the content connect as well as emotional connect, where the person is there speaking there. And that is the beauty of a lecture. That's why you want to attend uh, a discourse or a talk given by someone. So these are extremely useful talks. I do not know whether the average, it will, this statistics will be generally true for the entire class or not sure. That means everybody would be, would have viewed five to ten TED talks at least. But which five or ten? Now that depends upon one's own uh, now, how many of you have done this exercise of weaving a TED talk and writing the summary of that TED talk in your own words? That you may not have done. Because you try to absorb the gist of that TED talk in your mind. That is the purpose of weaving anything, no? On a video thing. But a very interesting and useful exercise is to actually view a TED talk and write its summary. It's almost like writing an abstract for your work based on the presentation in the seminar that you make. So if you ask your examiner that I will make a presentation for 20 minutes, at the end of it, please write an abstract of what I said. Curiously, that is what an examiner is doing actually while assessing you for a grade. That is what the examiner is doing. In his or her mind, an abstract is being formed of what you have stated, and on that basis, the assessment is made. But doing that exercise as a formal exercise is a very useful thing. So I will be actually giving you a set of 
10 TED Talks. Uh, we won't have any randomization. There will be numbered 0 to 9. And depending upon the last digit of your roll number, you are required to write an abstract. But these abstracts will be published. And those of you who wish can also visualize other TED Talks. We select them after a lot of care, trying to encompass different topics and try to see whether they remain, in some sense, related to the activities that you do. So that would be an exercise that you will have to do in the month of April. And there will be mock interviews for some people. So like placement interviews. And those of you who are already placed or something did not participate, but we will select people randomly. I am calling some industry associates to conduct these interviews. So they will be conducted in a small room, but they will be recorded on camera. And uh, I will see if I can connect through AVU. So while the people are being interviewed somewhere here, you can see what questions are being asked and what answers are being given. That would be fun. It would be useful, right? So that is what we propose to do it in April. And that is why I don't want to cancel classes. I think that is an important exercise. All right. Thank you.